Okay, we're live. We'll call the council time meeting to order for the 5th of May. We'll begin with the councilor. Okay. Councilor Young? I or here. <laughs> councilor Belcott? Present. Councilor Bowerman? Here. Chair Medvigy? Present. And Council Marshall? Here. Okay, thank you. Any amendments to the agenda? Chair Medvigy, I do have an amendment to request. Uh, would that be to add a one 10 minute potential litigation item? No after action. So it'll be the same RCW that's already listed down there. So it'd be 9.2 for 10 minutes action expected? No action expected. Thank you. Okay, without objection, we'll go ahead and add that to the agenda in the executive sessions. All right, we'll uh, go right to public comment on agenda items only. If only we were back in my courtroom, I'd ask you to remove your hat and sunglasses, but no, I'm not going to, because we're not in the courtroom. But go ahead, if, if you're the only one Starting. Okay, um, I know about the YWCA because I went there for 15 years. I spent the first six months getting help. Oh, Carmen De Leon, Mill Plain, down the street. Anyways, I spent 15 years there, and they're the ones who kind of got me. It's like the you guys, except like it's it's um, the the Speaker of the House, and there's a whole bunch of legislators. And so I used to do advocacy for the YWCA. You know, I spent 15 years, and and we used to. I'm gone through 15 to 20,000 girls one-on-one -on -one conversations, and the same old question was. It's epidemic. These men are out of control. They're abusing. They're doing this. They're doing that. Where do we find the good men? Where do they come from? How come they're all abusive? And what we determined after many years of debate is that really we have to create them. We have to make them. We have to make them from, that's why I say no drugs for let them grow up and give them a, a warm and loving environment. And I'll tell you right now, my name is Delion because of my father. He was raised from kindergarten till graduation in an all boys school, military style because his father was a colonel and his grandfather was a general. So that's in my bloodline to be military style. On my mother's side of the family, my grandfather was a bastard. He lived to be 103, but his mother and his grandmother fought tooth and nail to put him in the number one boys school military style boys school where he went from kindergarten to graduation in a military type environment. He lived to be 103, had 10 kids and provided a house for each one of them. Never went to jail, never had any domestic violence issues. He was a good man. And so was my father. What's the common denominator? They both were brought up in boys only military type school. So you have boys right now that are being brainwashed that you know they can do whatever they want. But I've spoken to juvenile delinquents, dropouts like myself, and they have told me the number one thing that kept them, put them back in line was to going to some, um, I guess it's like a, a work release, something for kids where they put them in a juvenile, boys only, a boarding house where he said he actually gained weight. It was good for him to be under those strict rules. And Barbara Walters went to an all girls school and how did she become a strong woman? Because there were no men there, you know, distracting from the education. So I know I have no short time, but I'm just saying you got to get back to basics. Boys get raised here strictly and girls there. And the, the other common denominator is that they have loving mothers. Strict environment at school, but loving mothers at home. And that's how you get good men. Yes, Chair, I do have one caller online. Please unmute yourself, state your name, and go ahead. This is Kimberly Goheen Elvin, Patriot, Live Citizen of Clark County, Washington, USA. Uh, looking at the minutes in print, um, I do not see where the open public comment speakers, there's three of them, whether they were on the phone or in person, that needs to be listed on there for um, uh, 
proper transparency of the minutes. So maybe you can add that today. Uh, also, it mentions I-5 safety about, uh, so we wanna make sure that there will be no light rail over the I-5 bridge and no tolls. And I wanna let citizens know that the mayor of Vancouver is pushing that agenda of light rail and tolls unless they stand up in assembly like our forefathers warned us to do. Um, also on the minutes was Office of, of Public Defense listening sessions. The um, listening sessions, uh, well, because of an open border, we have rampant crime here now and uh, thousands of different people here and stuff. You want 100 additional support staff there in the public defense. I'm gonna also listen, uh, say that your listening session also is funded and uh, supported by the YWCA. Um, you know, I'm kind of having a little conflict with that, but I get it when uh, groups usually start off with good intentions, but given long enough, men and women go corrupt as they have also with um, their equity and inclusion agendas. I wanna to speak to the 5.1 for Juror Appreciation Week. Uh, I want this changed immediately at your proclamation. It says um, that it, it states the word democracy. We are a republic. I want that changed, the cornerstone of our democracy, it says. I want that changed to uh, cornerstone of our republic. Also down below, it'll also say part of our dem democratic way of life. We are a republic way of life using democracy. So I want that changed on that proclamation for the Juror Appreciation Week. Uh, churches should be allowed cemeteries. I'm not real up on this, but they should have their own cemeteries. I did not know that they were part of agricultural, but I suggest that they start their own large gardens on their property and uh, for the people and uh, keep big government out of our cemeteries and churches. However, the churches can be involved in our government. People don't know that, uh, understand that very well. You're gonna go into an executive session and I'm, a, I'm really alarmed as you are building a foundation and um, actually weaponizing our means of safety here when it reads uh, the exec executive sessions you're gonna go into for 2.30.110, especially AI to, <laughs> that's funny, AI, um, to consider matters effectively national security. So to consider, and I'm gonna read this, and with legal counsel available information regarding the infrastructure and security of computer and telecommunications networks, security and service recovery plans, security risk assessment. Thank you, assessment, your time is up. Do we have any results. other callers? No, that is all. Okay, thank you. So that does conclude public comment. I didn't know whether to uh, respond to the military bashing or not. So I'll, I'll refrain, but I don't know of many I don't know of any of our service academies that are male only any longer or any studies that relate domestic violence to male military academies. But, I, and I appreciate the comments and the sharing of your personal uh, life. Um, it is that there are important messages and uh, so I appreciate your public comment. All right, so old business 4.1 refers to the minutes any changes or corrections? Yeah, I have a small change to suggest. Um, uh, I reported on the listening session for the Office of Public Defense, and uh, it would be better clarifying. Um, it just says right now, it says that I spoke about the Public Office Defense listening session, and the main topic is they need funding and staffing. It kind of sounds like that the Office of Public Defense needs that funding. So I would just offer the correction that the, to say, the, and the main topic is the lack of a funding and the inability to find staff by the counties, if that makes sense. Any objection to the corrections that Councilor Young is proposing? Okay, um, so motion to approve with that amendment. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 4.2. Board assignments focusing on the alternates. And yeah, there's uh, 
quite a few, more than half, that we have no alternates. So um, do we want to just start from the top and part of that discussion we've mentioned before that some of these would be appropriate to have an alternate from staff uh, appointed, um, but maybe not so much on, on others. So do we want to just start with uh, elections canvassing? No, I'm sorry, emergency commissioner. Uh, doesn't that just go from chair to vice chair to whoever's ne next most senior? We can certainly do that right now. It's just the, it just identifies the chair, but if you would like to have the vice chair as the alternate, that's fine. Okay, so maybe I'm confused because I had gotten calls before as the vice chair, hey, we can't get a hold of the chair, but we have this emergency declaration. Isn't that already part of our process? Yes, if there's any need for the chair to attend something or um, receive an award or something, yes, we usually go to vice chair first. Okay, so how do people want to do it? Do you want to have someone by name as, as the alternate or do we want the vice chair as alternate as I was proposing or I thought it actually existed, but I, I think it would be, it, it would make sense to just have it be the vice chair. I agree. For, for those positions where the chair serves in the primary role. Okay, we'll make a note um, on the side instead of putting the X to the vice chair. So in the future, um, it will always default to the vice chair. So we'll put that note on all of those items. Okay, any objection to that? I think we have three thumbs up for it. Um, going down finance committee. I think the next handful of these are under the same, um, it's the chair. So finance committee and identity Clark County and the law library board are all the chairs. So we can put vice chair as the. Any objection to that? That sounds like a good solution. Glenn, are you in favor of that? Okay, so um, any objection from those online? All right, so we'll make all those changes. So now we can jump down. Mental health sales tax, we have the chair plus one. So we already have two counselors there, but no stated alternate. Volunteer. I'm curious on, on this one, whether we really need an alternate. Uh, you know, when to me, the most important thing is that we have council presence at these meetings. And when it's chair plus one, un, I mean, unless both can't attend, I would imagine that's gonna be extremely rare. Yeah, I think from my point of view, it's just, it gets highlighted if there's a quorum issue with the actual committee and both whoever the uh, chair and uh, N plus one is, and they're both not available, it would be good to have an alternate. And if we had an alternate that was a staff member, we're probably not solving anything on these two committees, but what, what's your- uh, Yeah, that's up to council. So the, because the mental health sales tax, you start getting more involved when budget process, and I think it's already starting. And I think this is one that Jordan has, um, assume the role of facilitating, but anything that comes out of this group as a recommendation, council still has the final th authority to vote on that. So you can certainly have two in there or we could have Jordan be the, the second person if they need a vote. I'm not sure how often they actually vote versus doing the recommendations. Oh, and I take it back on the school advisory committee, there is an alternate, that's Sue Marshall. So um, we're just focusing on mental health sales tax. Do we want to have an alternate there then? I, I think that's actually not a bad idea. Just, you know, Jordan's there already. And if one of the counselors don't show up, we can have him as a voting member. So have Jordan as the alternate? Yeah, I mean, he Would already only, attends it anyway. Yeah, and again, final consideration comes back to the full council. Any other? Comments or preferences? Any objection to doing that? Hearing no objection, we'll go ahead and adopt that. 
Um, moving down to Echo, and let me know if I skip anything, but uh, Echo, we have two counselors already, but no alternate. And in the past, you know, when we were still on the Council for the Homeless, we had a staff officer there, a staff member present, and, and they were officially the alternate, but they were actually the mainstay, and that was Michael Torres. Um, so I, I would advocate that this is one, I mean, we, we usually have Vanessa or Michael on those meetings anyway, and if it's a quorum issue, I think I would prefer to have Michael or Vanessa as the alternate. Any support for that? Any objection? I support okay, that. Why don't we do Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and do that? I, I sense uh, three thumbs up. There, uh, we did skip one, the Area Agency on Aging and Disabilities. I'm the primary and it would be good to have an alternate. There have been occasions when... Oh, okay, thank you. I did miss that. Do we have a volunteer? I could, I could do that one. I'm sorry, you volunteered? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Hearing no objection, I endorse that volunteerism. A jail steering committee. Two members presently, but no alternate. And certainly this is already led by staff. Um, I'd be happy to do that one as well. Okay. Any? Okay, I'm seeing three thumbs up for that. Well, Ed Glenn. Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation, JPAC. And so I'm not sure where we're at in dealing with RTC and CTRAN on that issue. Jordan, do you have a latest on that? Good afternoon, Council. This is uh, Jordan Bogey for the record. Uh, my understanding is that at present, the way that the bylaws are written, um, there, right now, the county council does not have a seat on, on JPAC. They're one of the, the groups um, that is eligible for those seats, but they're going to reconsider uh, the membership of that at their meeting in December for next year. And so um, that'll be the time when um, this is going to come up again. But for the remainder of 2024, uh, there's not a, a formal council seat on, on JPAC within. So Karen and uh, Michelle and I have been on RTC, and I'm trying to remember if the three of us, I was the chair of RTC at the time this changed. And my understanding is different from what position they're taking now. Um, we had that seat. My recollection is at the time, no one on the council really wanted the seat. And at the time, CTRAN was saying, we really want the seat. We can make better use of it. It's more relevant for CTRAN. What we were told at RTC is that the council, county council, makes the nominations to fill the seat. And then they would just fill it at that upcoming um, nomination process that RTC has. So what we, and I publicly said it as the chair of RTC and as a council member here, that let's address this on a year-to-year -year basis. So we may want the seat back from CTRAN. And that's how we left it. And that's how the vote went. It switched over to CTRAN with the agreement that every year the county council would have first say on whether they wanted to retain that seat. So this process is totally different from what was explained back then, or at least as I understood it. Uh, Karen, Michelle, uh, comments? Uh, yes, I believe their anticipation is to uh, reconsider the membership completely in December, and that would include a counselor, if I recall correctly. So uh, I, maybe it is uh, taken care of 
without action on our part, but we should note to have a person available in December for sure. Yes, I agree with Councillor Bowerman and I was interested in being on that committee. Um, yeah, I, uh, it sounded like they were going to have the RTC vote on having either C Tran continue or have county a county councilor present in December. So, um, Councilor Mitch, or Chair Mabaji, I don't know when that changed, but I remember being courtesy copied on that email that Jordan was where they talked about it in their bylaws. But um, that's what I understand. Okay, so what I'm hearing is we'll just wait to see what happens. I have a clarifying question. So it's listed as JPAC. Uh, is that the same as RTC? No, no. Because that is C. We have designated C Trend for that. Or maybe I'm on the wrong spot. Yeah, that includes um, Council Marshall. JPAC includes the uh, it's Oregon and Washington. So it's. All the, if you look at the JPAC committee on the website, it's got county commissioners or counselors from Oregon representing. So it's Oregon Washington stakeholders. I think we should put down in for November a trigger to make a decision for a recommendation on that so that we're ready to go in the event uh, they agree to go with council in December. And we, that person can help make the pitch as well. So I, I would. So what I'm hearing is we're going to wait to see what happens at RTC. There's three of us who are members, uh, and we'll be there to vote or make nominations. Um, I just want to remind whoever wants to volunteer, and you can see it in the note. One of the main reasons why no one on the council at the time wanted to participate is it was in Portland and it was at 7.30 a.m. But now we're in a virtual world, so some of that's been ameliorated. Anyway, so are we ready to move on? We'll just... Yeah, and I'll just say we'll, we'll certainly put it on the calendar for November, but I don't think it's just a vote. I think it's a request to change the bylaws to include a county counselor because currently their bylaws do not include that. So. We'll bring back that language, maybe starting the end of October we'll on the calendar. Yeah, happy to make a note of that. And I, as, as I recall, um, there are fewer seats than there are bodies that could potentially have seats in that group. And so basically that's how council is not on it currently because CTRAN has a, has a seat instead. And so council could request to, to have those seats. Okay, so I'm hearing we can move on to the Juvenile Justice Council and the one just below it, Law and Justice. Neither one of them have alternates. I think it's important to have an alternate. Do we have a volunteer for the Juvenile Justice Council? And, and you can see by the note, this is one of those that isn't even required that we have a seat, so we don't need to attend. I will tell you that I gravitated towards it because most of my career was on dealing with protecting children. Um, but anyway, what, what, what would the council like to do? I would volunteer to be the alternate. Okay. Okay, you've got it. Super law and justice. <laughs> and keep, get me up to speed. Is, um, is Chief Mori? Still acting, he's he's the chair right now. Okay. And Councilor Marshall is the vice chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do we have a volunteer to be alternate? I'll volunteer for that. Okay, super. Any objection? Hearing none, you've got it. Going down to Lower Columbian Fish Recovery Board. Sue's now in place there. Do we have an alternate, and they often do have quorum issues. Um, so that is one, it's important to have an alternate. Who's the Fisher woman or man among us? 
Okay, I, I'll be the I'll volunteer to be the alternate. Okay, MPAC, uh, Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee. We have Glenn on it. Looks I'll like be the alternate for that. Okay, super. Uh, the opioid committee. We have two members. Do we need an alternate for that? I'm not. It's been a while since I've attended. Whether or not there's quorum issues with that meeting. No. I think. I think that could be another one where we could assign. Don't we have we have staff. That attend that meeting. I think uh, Dee Dee, I think, yeah. is the primary contact yeah. in community service. So we could probably, because to me, for continuity, I mean, you're learning a lot, and for somebody to come in the middle of the process, it doesn't really help that much. So to me, it would make sense to, you know, assign Dee Dee to be the alternate. Okay. How about uh, public safety sales tax funding? We have two members on board. I, I don't know that we need an alternate for that, and we still don't have a, a definite meeting schedule. Um, what What are your druthers? Any comments? Does someone want to be an alternate? And this, again, is the same as mental sales tax. There's discussions during the budget process, but the discussions this year may be a little bit more limited just with the available funding, uh, but reviewing fund balance policy. So. <laughs> or with sales tax booming, maybe we'll need more meetings. Okay, well, why don't we leave off the uh, alternate? How about the Regional Toll Advisory Committee? That's Michelle. Do we need an alternate, Michelle? I don't think so, and they're not very active right now because of um, Oregon halting the at least the 205 conversation with the tolling. Okay. Does anyone want to volunteer to be the alternate? Okay, why don't we leave that one without an alternate as well? Okay, the uh, Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization. We have Glenn on that. And I don't, how often do they meet? Yeah. I, I would also suggest that one, Mike Lewis would be great. He's at the meetings anyway, generally speaking, and it's another one of those ones that just coming in without any history doesn't, it's not very productive. So I think that would be a good solution. Okay, fair enough. So I think that covers all of them, at least we've talked, we've only left a few uncovered without alternates. We've made great progress. Any, Anything else on this issue? The only just one, a question. Um, just a kind reminder that if you're going to miss a meeting, please let us know as soon as possible so we can coordinate with another, with the alternate. Thank you. And I have just a question. I think Kristen and I had discussed putting uh, CJC on this list. I, the list that I have in front of me now, it's not there. And I don't know if there is an alternate. Uh, for CJC, I think that was the one where we don't even need to have any counselor present. CJC is a vote, so you are a vote on the board for the Children's Justice Center. So you're a vote, and I don't, and I agree with Councilor Marshall. I don't see this, see that on the list. I'm present at that meeting, but I'm not a voting member, and um, the the council member is a voting member. Mm -mm. And I'm the main representative, so I'm there. CJC, we, yeah, and we already, it's already assigned primary and alternate. Who is the alternate? Uh, I am Counselor Sue Marshall. Thank you. I, I didn't, I didn't know. We haven't needed that yet, but uh, thank you. 
I see it now. Yeah, that's the title, uh, Councillor Barman, just so that you're aware, it's Arthur D. Curtis Children's Justice Center. So it is on the list on the top half. But I can update it so that it, because I didn't know that, I, I was looking for it and missed it too. So I'll update it so it just says Children's Justice Center. But Councillor Bowerman, I know you and I have been talking. Are you attending those meetings? I do have yes. Chair Medvigy here, so I don't know if we need to switch that. I, I have been attending each one. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now I think we're ready to move on to 4.3, I'm not sure, is this referring to the cemetery issue, the zone yeah. consideration? So this was uh, based on council's uh, discussion and direction last week uh, where there was a desire to look at a, the normal process, not a, a spot zoning or a special process. So Oliver and Jose are here to provide some information for council. Okay, and uh, thank you for the recommendations and proposal. Did you want to make a brief presentation or discuss the memorandum? Yes, good afternoon, councillors. I wanted to provide additional uh, background <clears throat> and it's all also reflected in the memo if you allow me to. So good afternoon, councillors. For the record, Oliver Ojeko, Community Planning Director, and with me this afternoon is Jose Alvarez, uh, Land Use Program Manager in Community Planning. So um, as the council is aware, this request from Old Apostolic Church for council to consider a code change for cemetery on the property that they own came to the council or to the county um, in late summer. I believe, and we came before you in November uh, to uh, consider the request, and I believe the, the vote at the time was three no. Um, we have reviewed uh, the request at the time, and we provided you uh, or the council for a similar uh, option of what was done previously on or in the forest for the zone um, on a similar request from um, also Old Apostolic Church. And at the time that was in 2019, the council did uh, direct staff to make a change, which I will go through. Um, what I will say, councillors, is that in terms of history, in Clark County, a conditional use permit is required for churches in the rural district. That would be, um, Christine, if you go up to, um, if you slide up, here's the rural five district, rural five, 10, and 20. And in 5A, you can see that churches are conditional use permit in those rural districts. And then in five, you know, in 6G, as you scroll up, six G, um, no, yeah, six G you can see that uh, symmetries and um Other related uses are also um, conditional use in the uh, rural five. No, I, I, I really want to say 8G, if you can go back up. Eight G. so you can see in the rural five, under the county code that uh, symmetries and crematory and other uses, mortuary are also um, allowed uh, through a conditional use permit in the rural five, rural 10 and rural 20. When you get to the resource district, if you can scroll up, in 5A, you can see that 
uh, in Forest 80, churches are not permitted, as well as in ag wildlife. So it's only a conditional use permit in Forest 40 and ag 20. When you scroll down to 8G, no, 6G, excuse me, 6G, Um, you can see also that in the forest 80 and in the ag 20 in the in the resource district new cemeteries and uh, related uses are all xed out uh, the change uh, is all it's a conditional use permit in the ag wildlife the the conditional use provision with footnote 10 uh, was what was uh, the county directed us in 2019. That's how we were able to uh, honor the request from the um, old apostolic church, going back to what was done in 2019. Um, what I would say, councillors, is that this type of uh, limited uh, use regulation is similar to what you find in other counties. Um, I can say that pre-GMA, that is before the adoption of the Growth Management Act, in Clark County since 1980, schools and churches are allowed through the CUP or conditional use permit in the agricultural and forest district. In the rural district also, school churches and cemeteries are allowed through a CUP. So this is not new. You have to go back to pre-GMA to see that um, in, ch in churches, schools are allowed through CUP in the agricultural and forest district, but not cemetery. It's only allowed in the rural district with also cemeteries as a, a conditional use permit. So that is what had been in existence when GMA came into place and we continue that. So this is really not new. What I can say is that in our review of our county record, it shows that there are currently only four uh, churches in the Ag Zone, Mountain View, on 10 acres, and that was built in 1980. You have Amboy Church sitting on five acres, that was built in 2015. Uh, Highland Lutheran, they have like two properties combined sitting on 18 acres. One was built in 1945, and the other was built in 1980. And the old Apostolic Church sitting on 20 acres that was built in 2022. So that's what our record is showing when we, in our memo we indicated that there are only four churches in currently in the uh, resource district. As I presented those four churches, you can see when they were built. And in the memo before you, we provided council um, options for your consideration. So. It's up to council to direct staff on which option to work on, and I will stop there and take any questions that you may have. A question, please. Please go ahead, Karen. Would you please uh, explain a bit on item 6G, why Ag 20 uh, has the X there? Why is that not allowed there? What, what is the um, reasoning behind that? The reasoning behind that is because um, while I said it's consistent with what was in place in 1980 when GMA came to be, there was a provision in the uh, RCW 3670A170 uh, providing that uh, in the Act Zone that um, 
you allow uses that are predominantly complementary to conserving, protecting, and enhancing agricultural food production. So that was part of the reason, again, to comply with the provision of RCW 3670A-170. So that is uh, the primary reason for continuing to keep that as X out. Thank you, I see. Uh, further questions, Karen? No, thank you. Any other counselor, Glenn? Real quick, remind me what the zone was of the property that had made the initial request? It's Agricultural 20. Ag 20, okay. Yes. Um, so I have a couple comments. One would be I'm not very supportive of a process like before, which is to say, okay, everybody that now is here can go ahead and do this, but from now on, no more. To me, that's still basically a spot rezone. Um, but one of the things that I'm curious about is, to me, it seems worthy of investigating that anywhere where we currently allow a church with conditional use could also be allowed a cemetery with conditional use. I don't know. I mean, I would imagine that it's very rare that a church even wants a cemetery. I mean, do we know that there would be suddenly this rash of cemeteries showing up because we did allow that? Do we have any information or data around that? Well, there was one that was built in 2022 on forest land, and now this last one was built, what, in 2023? And in talking to the applicant, they are interested in locating additional churches to serve a projected congregation of a thousand. So I think I think they'd still be looking for additional land beyond this one exception that is suggested. Um, the only thing I would say, Councillor, is that you asked the question, the, the churches that were built in 2045, 1980, 2015, and also another one which was the Mountain View built in 1980, they have not requested that they have a cemetery, for example. So they knew, I, I, I'm not speaking for them, but I'm sure they knew that uh, that is not permitted in the Ag Zone. They have not made the request. This request is coming from Old Apostolic Church, and it was a similar request that they made when they built the church in the forest zone that prompted the council at the time to ask us to uh, make the change that we made. If you restrict this, it's not going to be a zone change. You're not changing the zoning. You're only making a change to Title 40 to allow this based on, if that's your direction, on the churches that are in existence now. Um, if you then decide, as Councillor Marshall was saying, based on your conversation with or the apostolic church that they want to build additional churches. I don't know if that is going to be in the ag zone. If you were to open that up, that will require us to do some research as to how that will comply with the RCW 3670A that I mentioned, and that could be done if that's your direction. That will open the entire resource area up, a wide open to allow churches and cemeteries on ag land. So how that um, enhance, protect, and encourage food production in the ag, um, that is something that staff will review if that's the direction of the council. Uh, recall that, uh, as I indicated, I show you churches, and uh, if they want to build cemetery, it's all allowed to the conditional use permit in the Rural 5, Rural 10, and Rural 20. So I don't know where they will be buying land in the future if they acquire land in the Rural 5, Rural 10, or Rural 20. They can also do a CUP for cemetery. 
It's only when you get to the resource district that there is a limitation. So let me let me weigh in. I, and Michelle, I don't know if you were, you weren't present at the last meeting that got us to this one. Um, and I don't know if you met with this particular church. Let me just say what the salient points are for me. Uh, one, um, among the most solemn support that a church can give its parishioners is how they commemorate the dead. And this particular church doesn't have a safe alternative right now for the cemeteries that are available to them. I am looking for a solution for them, some opportunity where they can create their own cemetery, and I believe they wanted to do it on four acres that they now have adjacent to their church, on their church property. So as to Glenn's point, you know, we, we can never bind uh, future council and changes to code. We can't do that. And what we're talking about is not spot zoning, but any church that's similarly situated could get a conditional use permit for a cemetery. The land, whether it's forest or agriculture, it's already been converted. It's already a church and church property. It's not going to be torn down and restored to either uh, agriculture or forest land. It's going to remain a church. So I like the approach that you had in the memo to expanding it um, for a conditional use Not spot zoning, but allow if there are other churches out there, and we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't heard from any others uh, that that wish to do this. But I'd like to give them uh, an opportunity to solve their issues and to create the cemetery they want and make it unif uniform so it's not just for this church alone, but for any that are uh, similarly situated. Uh, the only other random comment I would make is, you know, looking at the conditional uses, I don't know a thing about crematoriums, but the fact that you have a pro prohibition for 200 feet between a crematorium and a residential property is, I'm like, really? That seems pretty close. I mean, we, we put marijuana dispensaries a thousand feet from, from homes and schools and things like that. Um, you know, I, but I don't know anything about crematoriums, um, but, it, but it is something that caught my eye in the existing conditional use language that we have. So anyway, I'm in favor of uh, moving forward and allowing, uh, giving them an opportunity through a conditional use process. Um, Michelle, you're the only one that hasn't publicly spoken up about this. I don't know what your questions, concerns, or thoughts are. And then I know Glenn has some additional comments and questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did talk to Mr. Rose, um, and I'm aware of the situation, and I agree with you. I I was in favor of this the last time we discussed it. I think I was maybe the only one. Um, to your point that it is a church, it's always going to be a church, and they own the property. So why not? consider this. I absolutely 100% agree um, today and the last time we discussed this. Okay, Glenn, and then we'll go to Sue. So I think, I, I feel like we're going about this the wrong way. And the reason why is we grant this one, but then there's the next one that's going to come. And so the, I feel like the, the real fix to this would be to, to determine where our cemeteries where should we have them? And my thought is without having any knowledge and any information on the situation, it makes sense to allow churches in general to be able to have a cemetery on their property if they have enough room. Now, saying that, I don't know the impact, so I would need to understand those impacts better to make that decision. But to me, the, the fix would be to 
find out if it's responsible to have it in certain circumstances and then blanket allow it rather than just approve a one off. And, and I mean, there's four churches, but still really this is about one individual property in my opinion. And I, I just can't, I, I'm not gonna be supportive even though I'm very sympathetic and would lean towards allowing the use of cemeteries to any churches, again, not having all the information in front of me, um, I just, I don't support going about it this way. Thank you. Well, I, I wasn't supportive of this last time and I'm not gonna be supportive of it this time. And even though there are two other counties that uh, allow this to some extent, I think that, uh, you know, if they had purchased R20, there'd be no problem at all. And I know there are some R5s uh, surrounding uh, the property that they own and there would be no problem uh, with that. But as far as agricultural resource land, it's, a, uh, it's, it's continually diminishing and I think the applicant, you know, was aware that there was a restriction related to cemeteries going into this. Uh, and I think if, if this goes through, which it may well go through, uh, there's nothing really that's going to prevent this from, well, I guess the majority of the council could prevent it from happening again. But it, uh, it does not really, it's not complementary to agricultural uses. And even though the zoning does not change, the, the use is, it's not u useful at all really for agriculture at this point. So I, uh, I'm, I as I said, I'm sympathetic uh, and I have no problem with cemeteries being located uh, next to churches, but I am concerned about the continued loss of agricultural land. Let me pose this as a question to Oliver. If it was basically grandfathering in churches that exist today, not converting other farmland in the future, are we able to accomplish that by a simple code change? Yes. Okay. So uh, any further discussion or questions? Well, I just want to comment that I don't uh, see this as removing agricultural land from service in any way because it is not in use as agricultural land now. It is the part that is being uh, sought for a cemetery is a part of the church plot and that's just the, where it is. And it won't be expanding. They're not asking for another piece of land that would be converted away from agriculture so to me, this is uh, clear cut that it is land, their land, which uh, they could use for this purpose in, in my judgment. So I, I agree with you 100%, Karen. Would you like to make a motion so we can see if we've got three thumbs up today okay, uh, to move I would, this forward for Oliver? Yes, I move that uh, with the item that is uh, before us, for the, um, I don't know what to call the church. What is the name of the church? This, this one is called, uh, the request is from Old Apostolic Church. Okay, if you're so. you're proposing to make a code change, I don't think you wanna be specific about who. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I agree with Jose. Um, we need clarity on whether or not you want the code updated for all existing churches and no future churches, or are you only going to do it for the one specific property that's requesting? So it? let's just leave the church name out of it. going to be it. for the one specific property. So Councilor Bowerman's motion is just for the one specific church property. I second that. Okay, uh, there is a second further discussion. I have a question before I want to ask Oliver and Jose, can this be done only on one specific property um, or if you need time to look into that? 
The proposal that we put in front of you was to use the same methodology that we used last time for the forest zone designation that applied to the existing churches at the time that the code was adopted. So it would apply to this church and the three others that are currently in existence. I don't think we could do anything more specific than that. That would be fine with me as far as a, an amendment to my motion if, um, you know, if that's the way that it should be. I think that would be fine. I, I wasn't wanting to expand it to all churches that might come to be in the future. Yeah, you know, my comments and discussion last time was I wanted to avoid any legal argument about spot zoning and to be fair for any other churches that are similarly situated. I just always thought that was a more fair approach, even though it may only in reality right now apply to this one church. And that was uh, also, I think, Councillor Young had raised that objection originally when we first had voted down the, the initiative to spot zone. Further discussion? Go yes, ahead. Chair. So my biggest thing is ultimately it looks like there probably will be moving forward with this, which I will be happy in the outcome because I do like them to see, I do like to see them get their cemetery, but I still think that the process is wrong, especially the fact that one specific church was mentioned. This is a spot rezone in, you know, an always but name. So when you limit it and you say churches that are in existence now can do that, but that's only four churches, this to me is going to set it up to where in the future we're going to have another church that buys a property in the land that's not properly zoned or according to code, and they're going to come before us and petition to have another cemetery. To me, the proper way to settle this is to evaluate should we have it in this specific zone as a conditional use, go through that information, and then allow any church that fits those parameters to have a cemetery there. So I can't support it as it's being proposed right now. I want it to exist, but this is not the proper procedure to do it. Glenn, would you like to make an amendment to the motion and expand it the way you just described? Well, my, my amendment, if accepted, would be to send it forward to staff to look into the impacts of allowing a conditional use cemetery permit at all locations that currently allow for a church with a conditional use permit. I will second that for all the reasons I previously stated. I just think it's a more fair process. I have a question. Is this, would this be uh, subject to an appeal to the Growth Management Hearing Board? Is this consistent with uh, the protections on agricultural lands from your opinion? I think the, the proposal that we put forward, um, well, I agree with Councillor Young that generally this is probably not the way you want to do this, but there's a unique circumstance with the resource land where we have to show that we're trying to do this balancing act. And so we're limiting the impact by limiting it to the existing churches. Yes, and that would be the information that I would hope that staff would look at. Um, you know, look at it openly, look at the counties that are currently allowing and see what's happening there to understand because I, I, I understand that, but I also see this as I don't see a large number of church all of a sudden opening up and, and building cemeteries on their property. Most churches don't want a cemetery on their property, even if they could. And I just want, would add, based on Councillor Marshall's question, you know, it, maybe it's splitting hairs, but we're not talking about converting agricultural land. We're talking about existing churches that are not agricultural land. They may have been within a greater agricultural zone, uh, but it's not converting forest land or agricultural land to cemeteries. It's allowing a church that exists today 
to build their own cemetery on a small portion. So, Chair, just to make a correction, so my motion would would expand that potentially because my motion was that any any parcel that's zoned appropriately that can accept a church unconditional use could also apply for conditional use for a cemetery. But again, I'm, I don't know if I'm in favor of that, but I am interested in, in having staff look into that and bring us information so that we can make a decision on whether that would be the appropriate course to go. So I would like to move forward with votes on the two motions, the original motion as well as the amendment to the first motion. I would just make this observation. It sounds like we have four counselors, four, and one counselor opposed. But then there's a 2-2 split on what's included and what's not, with the original motion basically restricting it to a single church, which I think causes the spot zoning issue and legal, uh, or to the legal four. issues. Or, or to the four churches. To the four. I'm sorry, Karen, it was four. You're, yeah. you're not limiting it to just the single church that you started to name, but the four churches. Correct. Okay. So as a matter of procedure, um, do we need to vote on the amendment first or the original motion? The okay, so there's a couple of things going on here. So I think, first of all, um, Councilor Bowerman had made the initial motion. It was seconded, and then she amended her own motion. And I did... Councillor Belcock, did you second or agree to that amendment? Uh, with Councillor Bowerman's amendment, yes, I did. Okay, and so really before any other motion was made, a vote should have been taken on that particular one. Thank you, okay. I, and I agree. So any further discussion on uh, Councillor Bowerman's original motion with her amendment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. Okay, I believe it was three to two, the motion carries. Okay, thank you, Oliver and Jose, for the further work that you did on this and the further work you will do on this. So the next step will be just Real quick clarification. So just in terms of procedure, so the second amendment really wasn't valid because the first amendment had never been voted on. Yes. Okay. That's correct, right. I, I should have jumped in, but there, there was discussion. So, but yeah, that's. Gotcha, thanks. So next step, Oliver. Next step, uh, staff will consider this through a Title 40 amendment and come back to council. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about any questions. We go through the planning commission before we come to the council. I don't want to, it's not that I was ignoring your question. Um, if we were to look at this entire ag zone, because it's not a grandfathered use, pre-GMA, it will be subject to potential appeal. Just want to put that out there because it is a change. Okay, moving on to new business 5.1 proclamation. Mayor sorry, this is Leslie. Just to yes, jump please. in, just to make sure it's clear for the record, what we have down here is that the amendment to the motion was to include the current churches, but not future churches. So just making sure that that was the amendment. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Seeing positive head nods for the record. Thank you. Okay, uh, 5.1 is a Jordan Appreciation Week. Who, Jordan, you're presenting this? Yes, sir. Um, so, Council, uh, we have gotten a request from Superior Court, and uh, next week is uh, National Juror Appreciation Week. And so, we have uh, this request from them uh, for this proclamation uh, to be read, uh, celebrating all of the jurors. Um, who serve in, in Clark County. And so today we'd be just looking for uh, three thumbs up 
And uh, also to just say something I'm going to incorporate into proclamations moving forward in this conversation is uh, asking who on council would like to be the one to uh, read that just as a procedural item um, instead of waiting to figure it out, just doing that up front. So. Well, normally the chair would do that appointment. Well, that, that's great. I get, I'm happy to de so, defer to you, Chair. So normally I'm, I'm always looking to cut down the, the word count on these proclamations. Some of them are outrageously long, tedious to read, and lose the attention uh, of the public. Uh, this one is so scant. I mean, I, as a judge, I did better speeches to this to get convince jurors to be willing to cooperate and not try to do everything they could to get out of jury service, but to actually participate. I'm just, so I'm, this one is really thin. I wish it was, uh, had a little bit more substance to it, but I, I, you definitely have a thumbs up and I would like to read this because I may ad lib before and after to highlight some additional points. <coughs> Other comments, questions, do we have three thumbs up? to have this proclamation? I, I support. All right, it's universal. Thank you. If you could add a, another line or two, that would be great. About, <laughs> I mean, it's so important. And we've just had some aspect of it locally, as well as on our, one of our border states where a jury acquitted in a criminal case. It is the most fundamental right and Everyone out there would want a jury for someone they love, for themselves, to be able to sort through charges. Sometimes a prosecuting attorney files against the wrong person. Sometimes they overcharge. Sometimes they file the wrong charges. You know, jury service is critical. And of course, that's not even getting into family and civil rights. Uh, juries are precious. And, and an absolutely fundamental cornerstone of our Constitution, whether you call it a democracy or a republic, I think that's uh, unimportant. It is what differentiates us from many countries in the world, having a jury of peers. So anyway, uh, you have your three thumbs up, you have five thumbs up, and <coughs> read it, whatever it looks like at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Chair. Council reports, number six. Anyone at the podium? Anyone online? I have a quick report. Go ahead. Uh, this, this was an email that went out to all of us counselors uh, from the Washington uh, uh, County um, Associate, Washington State Association of Counties about uh, Clark County being the host county for their uh, upcoming uh, conference of count counties and that'll be now November 19th through the 21st. So uh, they are looking for recommendations on speakers and entertainment and thoughts on their visit to the area. So I just wanted to highlight that and put that on people's uh, radar. So thanks for doing that. And that brought up one other issue that the policy, you know, we just got the email from WASAC saying, how come you guys didn't sign on to this letter of congratulations? I didn't know about it. I Somehow I, I either missed it or it wasn't sent to me. I don't know if any of our WASAC, either on the, the legislative committee or on the WASAC representative receive these emails, but what do we do? Are we already past the time to recognize the outgoing director? What? So uh, for the record, again, Jordan Bogey, uh, senior policy analyst. I also just found out about this um, very recently, and I believe we do have a little bit of time. Um, I think they were hoping to get those proclamations by the 14th. <laughs> um, and so uh, they sent a very lengthy um, proclamation to, to the chair's earlier point, a um, couple pages long, uh, and so I have not had a chance since yesterday to uh, edit it down completely, but I am uh, preparing to uh, send out a, an edited version to, to council to hopefully get approval next week for uh, proclaiming 
the week after, which I think is just in time for the, the deadline to, to get to WASAC. So, and I think Cameron Bowerman had pointed out some of the strange language within the sample uh, proclamation, I'll just say it that way. So I would be in favor of a proclamation of our own writing that's as short or shorter than the one for your service. Uh, is there support for writing our own proclamation? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. I, I would support it. And there were a number of tongue-in-cheek uh, whereases with the uh, proposed uh, uh, proclamation. But I think embedded within all of those whereases were some we could pluck out. So you'll continue, you have three thumbs up. Um, you'll write something that's more direct and relevant and not weird. Absolutely, I will take out the extended Superman bit that uh, exists in the proclamation as currently drafted. All right, super. Uh, other council reports? Work session requests. So if I understand correctly, this may actually have come from you, Chair Mevaji, and it's a work session request with the YWCA where they can share the services in Clark County um, as primary domestic violence and sexual assault and, and also share how they're responding and collaborating with community organizations and law enforcement to help reduce that in the future. So I'm happy to summarize this, and I think there's two issues here. Uh, one is um, they've, they've offered a tour to all the counselors. I don't know how many have uh, been to any of their facilities before. Um, and I think the, the one I'm going on is this Friday. Um, and so we can do two at a time if other counselors are interested in attending. Now, what this is uh, as a result of a meeting I had with them months ago, um, especially after the pandemic, things got pretty bad and resources really dried up uh, for those who are victims of domestic violence. And I would also say it's not just women. Yes, it's predominantly women, but there is domestic violence, uh, male on male as well. Um, domestic violence is unfortunately prevalent in our community. And this resource that they provide and have provided for decades is um, precious to our community. So they, they wanted to do a presentation to highlight what the challenges are, uh, what they're trying to do to address it uh, at a work session. Um, so I told them I was in favor of it, but we would have to see if the entirety of the council wanted to hear what a description, um, you know, and it includes sexual assault, obviously, as well as domestic violence. It's another form of domestic violence. Anyway, it, are there other counselors who are interested in a work session? I don't know what, it says length of time, 15 minutes. I actually hadn't talked about that long a presentation, but I mean. We can always do 30 or 15. We're flexible. So I, I would say, support 30 so they're not overly rushed. Um, but is there other support from the council to hear from the white I'm, CA? I'm very supportive. Thank you for bringing this forward. And I, I appreciate us using our uh, work session time just for uh, informational purposes. There may not be an immediate action that we need to take. I think there's overlap related to homeless issues. So I, uh, I, I'm i very supportive. Okay, that's two. I'm yeah, supportive as well, supportive. so I'm a thumbs up. But I would caution that there are additional uh, resources in the community to assist those with uh, experiencing domestic violence. And I don't know if they could be mentioned or highlighted in some way along with the why, but um, they are important too. Yeah, just saying I'm supportive as well, and but also think that the 30 minute time frame would be a little more appropriate. Okay, so I think we have. Well, and I think 30 Thank minutes you. is good. And I will be on the tour on um, Friday with you as well, Chair. Okay, super. Thank you for that. We'll look forward to their presentation. Uh, I'm not sure how far out we're scheduling them now or when they would be available. 
uh, policy updates. I've got a few items for you today, councilors. Um, a few short ones. Uh, so the, the first one is just related um, to the conversation we just had. Uh, there was a question from staff, uh, and maybe this is to the, to the chair and then the full council about um, the treatment court month proclamation that council had approved. Uh, and there was a question about who was interested in uh, reading uh, that particular proclamation. Which particular proclamation? So this is uh, this is for treatment court month, which uh, council approved uh, previously. I'd so be happy who would to. like to read it? Who are the volunteers? I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. Okay, was there someone else that wanted to do it? I think whoever you appoint chair is fine. Okay, Karen, you're it. <laughs> By un un unanimous voice approval. <laughs> Other policy issues? Yes, uh, another request for a proclamation that just came in uh, today, actually. So I do apologize on the lateness. Um, Director Shook over at the jail just sent this uh, to me. And uh, next week is also National Correctional Officers Week. Um, so early May is apparently a popular time for celebrating all things courts and corrections related. Uh, and I do now have this in my calendar, so I will get this to you earlier next year. But um, this was sent over by the by the director, uh, another short one, and um, requesting uh, essentially uh, to have this read next week. Um, so I would welcome any any thoughts um, from council, and then would be uh, seeking a thumbs up or down uh, to to announce this proclamation. I'm happy to support this, and would nominate Sue Marsh. We did. Are you on the jail? Yes, I'd be happy. I was going to volunteer, and thank you for appointing me. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, do we have three thumbs up for the proclamation? First of all, okay. We universally we do, and we'll if it's okay, we'll have Councilor Marshall do the reading. Anything further from policy? Two more items. One is short, and one is a little lengthier. I'll start with the short one. Um, just wanted to give uh, council a heads up, uh, forward this to folks as well, but the state uh, Department of Commerce has, uh, after some delay, provided uh, a draft version of their local guidance related to homeless action plans. And so, um, so you know, Council for Homeless put that together uh, on a, I think every five year basis, typically, um, and the state comes down with, with different requirements, but uh, they have just released their their draft guidance um, for localities, and so they're uh, looking for input on that. And so I'm sure uh, staff will be able to provide some of that, but also want to just uh, let council know and, and the community. Jordan? Oh, sir. Sorry. Uh, what I would ask if it would be possible for us to get just kind of a uh, a summary of the changes. I'd be interested in, in seeing what they're focusing on. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I know they have a, a public comment and uh, I, I was thinking we should send that out to the uh, members of ECHO. And uh, do, do you recall when that deadline is for submittal of comments? I believe, oh, I have it written down. It is June 7th. So the timing is strange. And untimely because I mean, Council for the Homeless just did all their outreach to all the cities, getting their input on what they wanted to do with the homeless action plan. And now, so your point is, what are they emphasizing? What are what are they changing? Hopefully, it's not a whole lot of new direction because we really would need to go back to the cities and redo all the work that the Council for the Homeless did in their outreach. Um, just to a concern. And I will add, Vanessa had shared um, with Jordan and I this morning that they've been waiting for this information for about two to three years. So this, you know, while they have a short turnaround, we've been waiting for it for quite some time. Two to three years. So that was a short one? That's the short one. Here okay. is the, here's the final and uh, longer item that I have for you today. 
so as you'll recall, um, council in January approved the use of 1406 um, supportive housing funds to, to two projects. Um, one was to the Weaver Creek Commons project in Battleground with the VHA. Uh, that one we're not talking about today. The second one uh, that council approved was $130,000 to support renovations for plumbing and electrical work at the Recovery Hotel um, on 78th Street, just off of I-5, Highway 99 there. Um, so I, I just got um, some information today from Vanessa and she and community services were looking for some policy guidance from council. And so, um, sorry, trying to coordinate my notes here. Um, so typically when community services sets up contracts related to uh, providing services like this, they, they set up a time frame of which, so basically we, if, if the county is giving money to recovery hotel to do these upgrades, they want an assurance that the building is going to be used for the purpose of supportive housing for a period of time. And because this is not a, um, you know, it's not in the millions of dollars, $130,000 is not nothing, but it is less than some other projects. The, the term that community services had settled on was, was a term of five years that they wanted uh, to have assurance that the building would be used for supportive housing. Now, Lumen Fidelis, which is the organization that is um, running uh, the, the, the property and is the, the lessee, but they do not actually own the hotel. They are the, the group that requested the funding to, to make these upgrades. But the owners of the hotel, who, who are not Lumen Fidelis, they have been unwilling to essentially do this deed and covenant process to ensure that for the next five years, this building will be used um, for recovery housing. And there was just an article in the Columbian um, basically talking about how prior to Lumen Fidelis and the recovery hotel moving into this property, there had been a previous uh, lessee um, who had invested a significant amount of money and who was under the impression, um, and I don't know the specifics, I can't speak to the, the specifics of the case, but who is suing the, the property owners um, because he believed that he would be able to stay in this building for some period of time, invested a substantial amount into some upgrades, um, which has created some questions basically about uh, whether or not that combined with the reluctance of the property owners to provide the assurance just has given community service some pause about moving forward with this. And so uh, then the, the question to, to council is, uh, would you be amenable to basically, basically in the absence of any kind of assurance, would we want to then take that money use it for a different project, or, um, or uh, if council wanted, we could move forward without the assurances that this building would be used for this purpose for the next five years through this deed and covenant process, but essentially looking for policy guidance around, in this instance, how would you like community services to proceed with this program? So this sounds very complicated, and I guess what I heard was, Vanessa, you, gave her a pause. Um, what is the recommendation? I mean, is it to back away? Is it to just hope for the best that this 130,000 plays out for to some beneficial use into future years? Obviously, we need recovery beds. We need the supportive housing. It is a number one priority as far as I'm concerned. But what is there more of a specific recommendation from either Vanessa or the manager on how to proceed here? Yeah, and I can let... Jordan, correct me if he's heard something different, but I think the recommendation would be we continue with the funding as long as we get what we need um, to secure the years and the specific use. And if they're unwilling to do that, then we would um, recommend coming back to council and look at another use for that funding. Okay, comments or questions? Go ahead. Yes, so I, I think this is a really important project. Um, however, I do agree that we need to be good protectors of the public tax money. So 
with that being said, I think if we are not able to find some way, and I hope that staff will get creative in looking for those ways that we can guarantee that we can have a, a reasonable guarantee that we have at least five years. Um, I mean, that would be my my intent is that we work and exhaust any possibility to make sure that we're protecting those funds. But if we cannot come to some way to protect them, that I think we should redirect that funding. So, and what, so what I heard not only today from Jordan, but also his memo or his email about it, staff, the PA have exhausted their ability to put a covenant in place and the owner's not gonna do it. So I don't know if there's any other creative guarantee, but I, so I think you're at the place factually where we can't guarantee anything. We can only hope that, some, that once we make the investment, it'll persist into the future. Am I right or wrong about that? I, I, I saw a reference to the PA and their work on it. Yes, I, Council, I can um, talk about that. Uh, thanks for bringing this up, Jordan. Um, so the conversations that have been had is that the owners uh, will not go through that process in terms of changing the deed. And so without that process, there really is no guarantee that the money will, that that hotel will stay at, as uh, being used for that type of housing for five years. There's no guarantee. Thank you. And certainly an impending lawsuit shows that it may very well not. Um, just, so, just a couple of questions. So they've already said no to the five years of having it a shorter period than maybe we'd like that ball already said no to that? Or have we floated that five-year option? The, the five years is what was requested. Um, and they haven't agreed. And they have not agreed to that. Right. And the, so the, cert, the recovery service provider who we were going to be giving the grant to, do they have an agreement with the, uh, do they have a lease of any kind with the property owner for that site? My understanding is they do have a lease. I am not sure of the duration of, of the lease um, that they have with the, with the hotel owner. That, my, oops, sorry. My yeah. understanding is that it is five years that the lease is. Now that I've never seen it, but that's my understanding. So I think if there is a lease agreement, and it, if it is five years, uh, that, I mean that might make me feel comfortable. But isn't that the subject of the lawsuit that was in the paper? Is that lease? Uh, and I misunderstand that part. It is the previous lessee, so not not the current operator, but there was a different operator of recovery housing that was in place at this hotel until I believe September of last year. And then this request came to us in December of last year, and then council uh, approved in January. So if I might add to, from my understanding, read the article this morning, it was that they, that the lease ended and that there was the expectation that it would be renewed, but it was not. And I think it had to do with the investment that the previous VC had made in the property in the hopes that they would be there for a longer period of time. So thanks for that clarification. That is important to me as well. So it's not the present parties that we're dealing with as a county. This lawsuit really is a separate issue. Yes, it, I mean, the, the same folks own the, the building of the hotel, but it, it, it does involve a previous lessee. Okay. Karen, um, Michelle, what would you like to do? Comments, questions? I, I really want to go ahead with it. I'm just thinking this through. I'll be just a minute. And one thing we can do also is get a copy of the current lease and see what, if there's any termination clauses in there that would reduce potentially the five years and cut that short and bring that back to council. And that would be great. That, that would make me comfortable. Go ahead, Karen. That go would ahead, be Karen. very helpful. 
Okay. And yeah, I said the same. I said the same thing. I would like to take a look at that because we've had issues with leases in the past. Um, yeah, I would like to look at the language in there. All right. So can we put this off to get that answered? Because I would feel, uh, you know, again, it's not millions. It's one hundred thirty thousand. If we can get five years of use, even though no one will guarantee it, but the lease supports that five years of use. I think that is a good investment in this program. Um, that would be my druther. So could we so put one final question? So if there is nothing in the lease that would allow the termination prior to five years, can staff just move forward with the direction that we were doing? And then if we find language that it could be terminated sooner, we'll bring that back to council next week. I would say yes, I, I would be supportive of that. Just one kind of question about that. I, I'm, I'm curious, is it our normal process to require a covenant or were there specific details to this agreement that that was being required? So my understanding is from my conversation with Vanessa that this is typically uh, a requirement and often it's, it's longer, 10 or 20 years, um, but because this was a, a smaller investment with a with a smaller community organization, it wanted to be like the five years was trying to be more flexible. Okay, so as much as I want this to go through, um, I would like to have more. I don't want to just give the green light that if we have a five year lease that we just do it. I would like a little bit more information to understand what level of risk we would put, be putting ourselves, or not risk, but loss of the use of, good use of those funds. So if that makes sense, um, I mean, if it's our normal process to do a covenant and we're not getting it here in this particular situation, what is that exposing those funds to? That's, that's something I would like to understand better. So, so those are all interesting questions, but I think we've had three at least we had Karen, Sue, myself, Michelle, how are you voting to move forward? Yes. Yes. Okay. So with with yeah. uh, the manager's proposal to move yeah. forward unless there's something comes up that Thank you. Determined. And I will just say to Jordan, another piece to look at in that lease is the uses. If there's any way that they could change what the use would be during the that term. But yes, if there's any concerns outside, we'll bring it back. Um, and we'll let you know either way, but we'll bring it back to council if we need to. Thank you. So that concludes the policy updates. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, so we have two executive sessions with our lawyers, uh, 9.1 and 9.2, both p potential litigation, each for 10 minutes. Neither anticipated action afterwards, and it's RCW 42.2. 30.110, paren one, paren little i. So um, does anyone need a brief break? Otherwise, we could start our executive session at uh, 2.35 and anticipate to come back on the hour at 3. Is that okay? Or does anyone need a break? Okay, we'll go back and uh, go into executive session, then we'll be back at the podium at three.
Chair has asked to extend executive session for 10 minutes and council will now be coming back at 310. Thank you. Hello, the chair has asked to extend executive session for another 10 minutes and council will now be coming back at 320. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're, we've conducted our executive sessions. Uh, there is no action to take. Uh, we're back in session and we stand adjourned.